right, I do believe we are live. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of Shimano School. My name is JP DeRose, and I am joined by Captain Mo Newman from Journey South Outfitters. Mo, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are y'all? We're doing good. We're doing good. So we're going to let people roll in here. So folks, as you roll in, as always, I'll ask you to tell me where you're checking in from. I love seeing all the people from across the country checking in, actually across the world. Mo, we've had people from Asia checking in and watching these videos from South America, from everywhere. So folks, let me know where you're checking in from. Just type it in the comment section. We're going to be talking about fishing oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. There we go. Some people, uh, Luchi from Arkansas. Good evening, Tobago, Wisconsin. Ron, hope you're doing well on our YouTube channel. Uh, Robert from Oklahoma. Uh, hi, Nick. Nick saying, hey, Mo from New Jersey. Mo, oh, can you see those comments on the side there? No, I can't. No? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, we got Buffalo, New York, Colorado, Florida, Charleston, South Carolina, Georgia, Minnesota, Boston. People are checking in from everywhere, which is great. I hope everybody's doing well, everybody's staying safe. So, tonight, we are going to be talking about the oil rigs in and around Venice. Blaine said, What's up, Mo? Hey, Blaine. Um, <laughs> so, we're going to talk about oil rig fishing and the plethora of opportunity that exists. If you have not checked out Mo and Eric Newman, Journey South Outfitters, you could do that. They've been doing this a very long time, have a phenomenal operation. So I say we just kind of get to going where we want to go here, Mo. Let's let's kind of start things off and introduce people to what it is you guys do. Explain to me what Journey South is right off the bat. All right. Journey South Outfitters is a lovely husband-wife team with my lovely husband eric anyhow we have a lodge all-inclusive lodge down here in venice louisiana where we do everything from inshore to offshore we're chasing bull reds all the way to blue marlin everything in between and if you know anything about venice we have quite the fishery and i believe one main reason why we have such a great fishery is because of the oil rigs and the mississippi river and the nutrients it dumps in um so tonight we're going to go over pretty much uh say like a week one whole week of offshore fishing the oil rigs in this hour <laughs> so here we go <laughs> all right so we got a ton to get to uh just a quick shout out to a bunch of people so folks we are both live on youtube on the shimano north america page and we are live on facebook this video is going to live in perpetuity on these channels you can if you have a buddy who's interested in doing a trip down to fish the rigs you can tag them in the comments so that they will get this video. And if you click the share button, that helps us get the word out. So I think without further ado, Mo, we ask these people, if you got questions, what do folks, you want to know? What do you want to know about oil rig fishing? We'll start things off. And I've actually got a map up of the area so you guys can see kind of what we're talking about. But we got people from all over. So let's get the questions. When you guys start hitting them up, we will start answering them. Let's start with the area, Mo. I'm going to share my screen like we did earlier. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's put on the chart viewer screen. All right. So for those of you who don't know, Mo is in this area here in Venice, Louisiana, but we're talking about oil rigs. So I'm going to make this a little bit bigger here. And Mo explained to me that Venice is kind of right where the land ends, correct, Mo? Right there. So what you're seeing that yellow area, that's the last bit of like residential stuff and commercial stuff. After that, you're going to have just miles and miles of marsh. And then after the marsh starts your oil rigs, which is just a whole nother world within itself. Um, once you get out of some of these passes, You'll have a rig starting some at just a mile, you know, right outside the passes. And then they'll go some 90 miles out, some 100 miles out. Like there's rigs everywhere in uh, this whole Mississippi River Delta area that you can fish multiple different species in a day. And um, like what you're showing right there, that looks like four rigs to me and all those black lines are all the pipelines that are coming to and from the rigs from the offshore uh drilling and then wow. from that spot all those pipelines go inshore to a refinery uh here up where like, like hard land is and yep. 
it, all of it's through pipelines, miles and miles of pipelines and the infrastructure in this, you know, oil field and gas industry is just mind blowing. All right. So uh, it seems like the rigs are all in varying depths. As you get further out, naturally, it gets a little bit deeper. So you've got stuff. It looks like as shallow as five, six here? feet, five, six feet. Really? Yeah. And all the way out to, is this, would this be considered blue water out here, Mo, when you get out this far? Um, no, you're actually not that far. You're, that's going to be like 40 foot. If I, if I'm in the area where I think you are. Yeah, this you're is, gonna uh, this your is saying, yeah, this is saying 60 foot right here. Okay. So that's still what we can call our shallow water rigs there. Um, those rigs are going to hold everything from redfish during certain times of the year sheephead black drum mangrove snapper red snapper co cobia some spanish mackerel um oh man we have a bunch of bait that holds there like corn bellies some hardtails get in there uh oh the list goes on and on that's, <laughs> well it does <laughs> seem like the opportunities are pretty big and, yeah and again like that, like if, that, go ahead no, no, go ahead. That area is called East Bay. And in East Bay, there's at least 50 different rigs that you can spend a whole day just hopping around from rig to rig, targeting, you know, catching fish at all of them. Wow. And yeah, and I'm that's seeing really one. Nice. Go. I'm seeing ones way out here, like South Pass 89. We're talking like 396 feet of water. Yes. And so th that rig right there, you'll hold, um, we'll hold your amberjack, your red snapper, your king mackerel, um, cobia sometimes, um, blackfin tuna, bonita will hold it, that rig. And in the Venice world, that's still considered shallow rigs because you keep going out and you're going to get to 5,000 feet of water where your floaters are. And, wow. you know, just it's it's hard to wrap your mind around everything that Venice has with all these oil rigs. And, you know, the possibilities are endless here. All right. So folks, uh, I mean, that should be a pretty good sign that yeah, possibilities are endless species are endless. So uh, Blaine's going to start off the questions here because uh -oh. Blaine's been there a few times, but he's saying, <laughs> well, what's, what's your favorite technique? Jigging. I could, I could go jigging around these rigs all day long. And to me, jigging is going to offer a variety of species. For one, um, if you're doing a fast jig, it's going to be your amberjack. And when you hook an amberjack in these rigs, you have to then, uh, your biggest obstruction is going to be the pipes, the legs that come off of these uh, oil rigs. Because the oil rigs do not go straight down. Like they're going to be in 200, 300 foot of water. And what you see at the surface, underneath there, the legs be out. So even though you're 100 yards off the rig, that leg's still underneath you. So when you hook these amberjack, you have to back out of the rig hard to keep them from turning their head and going in and breaking you off. So that is like, to me, the funnest challenge ever is getting the fish out of the rigs. If you have to use the boat to back it out, or if you just have to step up and man up and, you know, get on that fish and get them out. <laughs> so it's, okay, it's exciting. So Clients don't expect it. Interesting. So you mentioned that if you're jigging fast, you get the mm -hmm. AJs, but we've, we had a talk with Benny Ortiz and we did a, a whole thing on uh, slow jig, slow pitch, mm -hmm. slow pitch jigging. And so, have you guys been implementing that technique for more of the snapper grouper game there? Yeah. So, you know, each species feed differently. Your faster things are going to be more of your pelagics and then amberjack. Slow pitch is going to be your snappers and your groupers. And a lot of cobia that hang out with these rigs, they're going to like the um, wing fall and your flat fall stuff. So if you're approaching a rig, say it's 200 foot, um, you're going to work the rig 360 because the fish, different fish are going to hold a different size of the rig. What you're going to do is drop to the bottom. And if you're working a, um, a slow pitch jig, what for that jig, you're going to keep it on the bottom and maybe up 10 foot and just doing high pulls and letting it drop. And then if you're on your way down and you hit a rig leg, stop there because the groupers really like to hang out on the rig legs because, um, all these rig legs are full of coral. 
and you know that's something people can't believe like underneath the water is just big coral reefs in a sense so it's really knowing what you want to target around these rigs and how to target them Interesting. Um, yeah so like you know your amberjack setup i would not use for a snapper grouper setup um just because it's going to be different you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> different techniques yeah different amount of pain in the body too between an amberjack and a snapper i find i yeah. mean the amberjacks yeah. are relentless if you haven't if people haven't caught them i mean reef donkey for a reason right yeah they they are pound for pound they're tough fighting fish and that they're exciting to catch because they're just running and fighting all the way up all right so let's keep moving here um Nick is saying he hope the pups are well. COVID got in the way of a charter a while back, but he hopes to fish Venice with you guys in the future. So that's Nick Handley. Handley? Yes, um, sir. All right. So Matthew is asking, is there times that artificial is better than live bait? Um, oh, that's a tough one. Okay. Like, mm, fish, you know, all have personalities and attitudes. And there's times if I'm snapper fishing, they're going to want live pogies and they're not touching anything else. Um, and then there's times they're going to want all your jigs and all your fun stuff. And it's just really what I found the attitude of the fish that day. And so when I go, when I'm heading offshore, I'm bringing live baits to different plastics, to different jigs to cover the whole, my, all my bases. Cause I don't want to get out there and be like, Oh, well they wanted this. Right. So to answer your question, you know, it's just, it's a day-to-day -day Bases. I would never say, yeah, 100% live bait and yeah, 100%, you know, artificial. All right. So, Matthew, hopefully that helps you out. And again, folks, uh, we are live. Obviously, this is another edition of Shimano School. Uh, my name is JP Droz. I'm here with Captain Mo Newman from Journey South Outfitters. Uh, her husband, Eric, is graciously taking care of their guests right now. I, I imagine <laughs> they just fed them. So, um, Mo was on the water today fishing, and she's uh, actually done us a huge favor by joining us tonight to answer all of our questions about fishing the oil rigs off the Gulf Coast. So if you have some questions, feel free to fire them up in the comment section. If you have a buddy or a fishing pal who wants to fish the rigs, tag them. Just tag their name in the comment section, and they will get this video. It is both live on our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel. So uh, let's keep moving along here, Mo. Um so, oh, actually, Red Pass Rentals is asking, what mapping uh, do I have on my computer? So this is actually just Navionics web app. So if you go to webapp.navionics.com, uh, it's a free service. You can kind of see all of Navionics stuff. You can control whether you're seeing sonar charts or their regular charts. So it's kind of handy. I actually do a lot of work from home when I'm going to a new fishery using something like this. So anyways... Red Pass Rentals, uh, that is just, yeah, webapp.navionics.com. Yeah, and for uh, Red Pass Rentals, also, if you can put your sonar bottom on there, you can find a lot of good live bottom in Venice to fish if you want to get off the oil rigs. Because, again, the oil rigs are a challenge to fish if you're not used to it, where if you can find open water spots, they're going to be more, like, angler friendly if everybody, you know, can't get on a rod and get the fish tur head turn and get them out. So, um also, standard mapping has a satellite image for your inshore when you're running these passes. Because a lot, like what you were just showing, it's all yellow where our, topo our passes change all the time. So a lot of the guides down here run standard mapping, which is a satellite overlay chip to help you navigate safely through all these passes. How often do they update that chip, Mo? Is it, is it currently, um, like, is it a live update? I, no, I believe you can do uploads each year as he gets new satellite images. Because I, I guess the tides and the winds and everything change the sandbars and the passes, don't they? And the hurricanes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and, and then high yes, rivers. And the hurricanes. <laughs> and also, it's just good to stay in a know or like contact a guide down here on what passes are navigable. Like, for instance, South Pass, which used to be a um, one of the main channels for a lot of the recreational charter captains to run off, but is now silted in. So it's just good to be like, have your local knowledge down here when coming to fish Venice um, on what passes are operational because high river brings a lot of silt and brings sandbars and not, not a good day. <laughs> All I remember about Venice was sandbars 
and oyster bars or our shell beds. Yeah. You know, like yeah. gear cases do not last long in this area for no. some reason. No. Understandably. Okay, so, um, for those of you watching, obviously, uh, Mo is in an area where she explained to me that, you know, unfortunately, uh, signal is not the greatest. So we can hear you perfectly, Mo. Uh, I do know that your video is freezing a little. So, folks, we are not frozen here. We're going live. Everything's kind of moving around. We've already done 15 minutes, Mo, believe it or not. So, oh, man. Yeah, it goes by quick. So, folks, if you got <laughs> questions, get to them fast. All right, so let's see. Um, okay, well, uh, John from our YouTube channel, he's saying, with such variety, can you expect to target a specific species or is it best to be pleasantly surprised? Um, no, you can target specifically go out and target um a specific species out here and it all just comes into gear setup um name a species and i can go through this let's start with one of the best eating ones let's start with snapper all right red snapper red snapper here you can target anywhere from 40 foot of water to 500 foot of water um and now when I'm fishing them shallow, I'm going to fish lighter gear, like a 5,000 twin power, 6,000 twin power setup with a pro blue or a Travala PX rod. Um, I'm dropping, I'll fish live baits. I'll always go catch pogies and I always keep tuna bellies for their target red snapper. Um, mainly if you're marking them, if you're, they're going to mm, hold like mid level. Sometimes you can mark them on your screen. And you drop down once you find, say you're in 60 foot of water and they're holding at 30, you'll be able to mark them on your sounder and drop your bait down to them. And it's pretty much every bite. As we push out deeper, uh, your red snapper are going to hold more, more on the bottom. And you're going to want to fish your bait on the bottom. Um, and I'm talking deeper. Let's go to 200, 300, 400 foot. So if you're fishing a live bait or if you're fishing a jig, you're going to fish that jig on the bottom. A lot of the times the red snapper will not be suspended in the water com column where your amberjack will be suspended. Your uh, red snapper will hold, say, from bottom to maybe 50 feet up. So you're going to work your either your jig or your live bait uh, within that water depth to specifically target them. Um, and then again, if you're around rigs, they're going to be mainly on the bottoms around the out sides uh it's like it just takes years of like learning what species hold where in this you know sea of oil rigs so so, so you can um, target though you can say you you have clients yeah, who say exactly. we want to catch snapper or we want to catch cobia or we want to catch redfish you go out there prepared for yeah, that so species. like Cob Cobia won't hang out on the bottom. We find they're surface to like mid level and you'll use your sounder, you mark them. And I'll use more of a plastic long eel style bait for those. Um, and same again, I could still, if I'm shallow, I'm using my a 5,000 or a 6,000 twin power. If I'm going deeper and having a, maybe if I'm fishing 200 foot and I'm gonna drop down a hundred foot, then I'll step up to a twin power 8,000 with 65 pound you know max quattro on that because i could be dealing with rig legs as i come up or like change from um a drill ship uh so yes pretty much sum it up you can specifically target something if you like with also catching a variety of other species all right does that so make there sense <laughs> and there's a lot of sense there john hopefully that helps you. i know you said your que your question you said has been answered but i figure we can get a little more in depth there um, here's another one from Blaine. Um, what's the deepest you guys jig grouper and what's a big one in your area? What kind of grouper actually? Let's, let's start with what kind of grouper do you target me? All right. So here we have gag, scamp, snowies, yellow edges, Warsaw. Mm, I think I've covered them. Yeah. I, all I heard was delicious, 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 delicious. <laughs> That's all count I heard in, there. Count Sorry. me in, count me in. <laughs> um, and then so our grouper, I primarily jig anywhere from 200 all the way to 500 feet. Uh, with I like to use the wing fall and on a, let's see, what would my rod be? Like the Ocean Jigger 40. 
yeah, hold on. I got so much that goes on through my head. There's so much gear. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many species and there's so many combos. So, yeah, like I would, I would, that's what I would use. I would use the Ocean Jagger 40 with a grappler. I would go 5'8", extra, double X heavy and 80 pound max quattro just because you can be also be battling the rig legs as you come up. So I do want, you know, a hard, good, strong braid to get them out. Um, and a big grouper here, is that, what's a big one in your area? Let's see. A big one is anyone you successfully get up off the bottom through the rigs. There you go. That's a big one. Oh, I, I think Blaine wanted something more specific than that. I think he was uh, like, what, what, so I, I guess it depends on the species, obviously, because certain groups yeah. are bigger than others. I like uh, a few weeks ago, I've landed a yellow edge that was 40 pounds, which is a, a pretty big yellow edge and a snowy that was up in the thirties. So that's big grouper here for me. But then your Warsaws that you've landed before, you know, could be up in your eighties, nineties, you know, really much bigger fish. Wow. Jane, I'll, uh, Blaine, I'll get you jigging next week and we'll see what you can land. Oh, he, he's a glutton for punishment, Mo. I know you fished with him, but <laughs> he is one of those people. I've never seen someone who just thoroughly enjoys getting his ass beat. He, he really oh, it's does. So like much it. fun. <laughs> All right, here's Benny. We spoke about Benny. Hey, Benny, how you doing, bud? Hope you're doing well. Um, Benny's saying, what type of current do you experience near the rigs, and how does it affect your tackle selection? All right, so our current typically is less than a, a knot. Um, we really do not have big currents here unless uh, our loop current pushes in, which that's what controls our whole um, current system in the Gulf. Um, so... Like I can always go out with my standing, my standard jigging, which would be a Stella 10,000, a Stella 14,000, and two ocean jiggers, a 20 and a 40, set up um, with 65 to 80 pound max quattro, knowing that my current might be, a, you know, a knot or less, not much at all. Does that right. answer your question, Benny? Oh, that probably <laughs> does. Benny's like the master of knowing what size jig based on current and what he can get away with. And it, I, I learned like, so much from him on the, on the slow pitch jig. Like here, like there's like, if I'm going deeper then I'll drop an eight ounce, 10 ounce jig. But a lot of times it's just six ounces and you, you can get down to the bottom. Cool. You know, if, if I'm say 300 foot more than I'll go eight, but anything shallower than that, it, I'm, I'm four and six. Okay. There you and go, I know Benny. the jig ounces get technical. But well, and again, it's, it's, it's that system of matching the rod to the weight of the jig. I, I think a lot of people fail to realize that those rods are rated based on the weight of the jig, not on so the, much on the line. It's more yeah. so on the weight of the jig. Yeah. So, yeah, every rod has, you know, what ounces you should set up um, your jig with or, or what lure. And that helps me pair my stuff. But that's why I choose. I fish game type J's on my Stella's and I fish grapplers on my uh, ocean jiggers because I feel that allows me, those rods allow me to give a variety of jig sizes. If I need to go to 12, God forbid, and wear a client out. But typically, you know, four ounce to eight ounce is what we're throwing and those setups help me. All right, so then uh, we asked about species and Nick, we said, some, you said, let's ask, ask me about a species. Nick's asking about yellowfin tuna. And then the very next question from Damon was, what's your largest tuna caught? So, um, Targeting yellowfin tuna. We know you got a lot of them off the rigs. So. We do. We do. Um, and a lot of people, you know, they think Venice, Louisiana, yellowfin tuna. And, you know, here we go. I'm going to dive into it for you. Um, so when I'm live bait or tuna fishing, I'm first going out with live bait. And that is, depends on the season, anywhere from catching pogies, catching mullet, and we're fishing horn bellies or a butterfish. Some people on the East Coast, I think they call them a butterfish. I, no one likes them other than here. And then when we can get little hardtails or blue runners, we don't have tinker mackerel. Occasionally we have thread fin. So whatever bait we can get, we're getting hundreds of them. Um, and we're heading out to the rigs. I usually uh, look at Hilton's. Um, it allows me to give my chlorophyll and my currents and help me decide on where I'm going to go. And when I go, I have, let's see, um, one, two, I have three different setups 
for live bait. And it depends on the bait that I have and how finicky the fish are going to be. So first, um, Talica 25s is what I'm going to have across the board. I have two spooled up with a uh, 80 pound Power Pro spliced into 60 pound diamond to my leader, which my floral leader can be anywhere from 40, 50, 60 pound leader to anything from a 40 hook to a 80 hook, depending on my, you know, what's going on. Um, and then I have one that is straight. Uh, 80 pound max quattro with a PR knot to straight to fluoro. And I do that because sometimes when you're live baiting, just that little bit of tension with mono is going to drag your bait and not let it free swim. So that braid just glides right through the water. The bait feels no pressure. Um, and then and now let's go out fishing with my live baits. You're going to, everybody live bait chums here and the fish got conditioned to it. So if you don't have hundreds of live baits, Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. So you're going to, when you get mostly up current of these rigs, you're going to circle around, kind of find what the up current side is, mark your fish, seeing what's going on, seeing how your drift's going to go. You're going to set up of the fish that you're marking. You're going to put out your two live baits, and then you're going to usually unleash 50, not just kidding, not 50. 10 to 15 more behind your motors, kind of flush them out with your motors and let everything just free swim. No pressure at all. Just let all your baits just rock and roll. And while this is happening, if, uh, I know I'm probably getting confusing because this is no, a you're lot. Good. I got you. Go ahead. <laughs> keep going. I like it. Lot. Um, if you've got baits blowing up close to you that you feel are in, in closer than where your baits are. I have a Stella 20,000 on standby for a, a pitch bait. And right there, I'll just hook uh, whatever bait I have, you know, either bridle it through the eyes or right in the shoulder, pitch it out. And you're going to sit there and just hum out live baits one after another and get these fish keyed in behind you to, and hopefully your live baits get hooked. And when it does game on and you got to, Usually we're hooking twos and threes because when you get them up and get them fired up, you got to capitalize. So that's kind of tuna fish in, in Venice. It could be boring, boring, boring for hours and all of a sudden the world unleashes and everything's on fire and complete chaos. <laughs> and and size of tuna on average and then what's the largest? Oh, one man. Um, so typically, like with... Our setups, yeah, we're fishing 25s, but I'm fishing six foot and six, Therese, Tal is six foot and Therese six sixes, extra, extra, and extra heavy because we're landing between 40 pound to 150 pound tuna. And okay. a lot of these times when you're out fishing these floaters, which are 4,000 feet, it becomes an up and down battle. And so it's nice to have a nice heavy rod to, uh, you know, that's light enough to fight a light fish, a 40 pound, 50 pound fish, and has the backbone to, you know, land 150 or if you hooked up to a 200 pound fish. And my biggest fish is 220 pounds. <laughs> they, they get, I find they get pretty ignorant and rude after about 80 pounds. They become a bit of a pain in the ass, to be honest with you, after 80 yeah. pounds. <laughs> like if you've never tuna fish, you want to come out and catch your fun ones, your 40, 50 pounders. They're not going to rock your world and you're going to be able to enjoy it. But once you get 80, you're passing it off to your friends. Everybody's getting their butt kicked. And, and then it's just like, guys, you know, it's hard to enjoy it. But Until you eat it. Happen. Until you eat oh, yeah. it later on. Then you enjoy it. Yeah. Then we have sashimi and tuna pokey and we do all that. Yeah. There you go. So. All right, so uh, this one kind of falls right in the line. So what's your favorite time of year to catch tuna? And do you do you chase the shrimp boats in the fall? All right, yes, I do I'm with everyone else chase the shrimp boats in the fall. And that's actually where my biggest tuna was caught back in, I don't know, 2012 with Larry Dahlberg, actually. Um, now... The tuna fishing in the fall has slowly, I think, kind of been on a decline, unfortunately. We're not seeing the numbers of fish pushing behind these shrimp boats anymore. You know, there's days that you're watching 100 to 150 pounders, like 10, 15 of them just free swim around your boat. And now, like, you go a day and you're seeing maybe two, maybe three, and you got to make shots count. 
and then let's see my favorite time to catch tuna well, that's a hard one because we also have a lump season in the winter where a lot of your big fish come to and you're chunking baits there and that could be a lot of fun but it also could be chaos because during this lump season you're going to have like 60 70 boats all within a mile and your fish is in between all these boats that you got to chase but then you got summertime fish which are sometimes getting to a feeding frenzy and i don't know just the action of having all these fish come up behind your boat and hooking you know singles and doubles and triples is fun and then you got your shrimp boat fishes which is very visual so that's a hard one my favorite time of the year i just think Fish in Venice is fun year round. There you go, John. Right? Hopefully that helps you out. <laughs> yeah. There is no favorite time. It's all fun. Be here. Yeah, yeah, it's all fun. And now we're doing offshore, but William's a buddy of mine, and he's asking what's the best time to fish bull reds. Right and now. There you go, right Will. Now. Not not today though, because I caught a lot of catfish. But tomorrow will be better. <laughs> but usually in August. Um, our big our big breeders come in and feed on menhaden. They gorge on the pogies. And typically it's from June, July, August, September, they push offshore to spawn. And then they'll start pushing back in October as cold fronts start pushing in. And they get into shallower ponds. But I think right now is the best time for bull reds. It's pre-spawn, they're fired up, and it, it does not get old. All right, Will, hope you're doing well. Will is over on the St. Lawrence River, one of the best smallmouth fisheries in the world. So I uh, hope you're catching them, Will. All right, uh, let's see. Owen, good to see you again. Um, Spanish Max. John is asking about oh. Spanish Max. John, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know anything about Spanish mackerel. I occasionally catch them um, catching rig baits, but it's not something... I specifically target. I'm so sorry. Don't be sorry, Mo. You're giving out so much information. John, we will get you on one of those. We'll help you out with the Spanish Mac on one of our I'll lives. I'll do some recon for you. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so um, Nick's asking, can you target the yellow fin with surface plugs, plugs around the rig? And what's your setup for throwing artificials um, like surface plugs? Man, top, our top water bite pool, oh, I feel, has kind of been on a decline but it's a, a situation you got to be there at the right time and yeah i've caught several so or my clients have caught several so far on top water lures this year but my go-to um setups i actually have two one for small lures and one for big lures i got the stella fourteen thousand on an eight foot eight heavy ocean plugger with a 65 pound max quattro on that one and i usually throw this little uh baby orca out there because when I'm throwing that, that means they're keyed in on small baits, little flying fish, or, you know, um, little squids. And then my next go-to is for my larger baits, which is going to be in Stella 18,000 with an 8-foot-2 extra heavy grappler on with 80-pound Max Quattro. And um, that I'm throwing the flash. Oh, oh, here, I got the lure right here. Look at this the little FB, thing. FB-150, the flash boost 150. Yep. And then yep. my slim orca, which is also a great redfish bait, and the pop orca, which is also a great redfish bait. But these are the guys that I throw at fish. And um, again, the tuna, you got to be right time, right place to get yellowfin on top water. But it's so Is it because they're being fed so much they're getting used to the live bait, being dumped live bait, Mo? You think that's one of the reasons? You know, like... Over the past few years, our fishery is changing. Our charter fleet's increasing, and they're getting keyed in on how we're feeding them. Um, but they are days, like, flying fish will come through, and they are just jacked up on it, and they don't want anything, you know, that you're putting behind your boat. They're going to want a lure. And, unfortunately, the topwater action happens less time now than it used to. Um, I don't know. The fishery is changing. I just don't have an answer why it's changing. But it is. So, okay, so you held up two pretty different topwater baits. You had a uh, yeah. flash boost, Orca flash boost 150, and you had the slim pop orca and the pop orca. How are you guys working those different? Let's explain those to the people watching because they really are two very different topwaters. So here it's going to be um, like a big chug. 
And here I work just like an injured bait on the surface. Rod tips high and I'm skipping it across and letting that flash go. And then the pop orca for me, if anybody knows about the pop and cork, is like a pop and cork. Just big chunks. Pool, let it sit. Pool, let it sit. And when it comes like this, they usually smash it. So does that explain some, how I work my lures? Yeah, that's some that's some good <laughs> tips right there because I think people think all top waters are created equally, but the no. fish will be targeting on different moods, and that's why it's kind of important to have different styles of top waters. Some days they want the big commotion. Some days they want the subtleness of that one fifty, you know, flash boost or just even, across the water. Or even this little baby orca, if they're keyed in on something tiny and you just throw it out there, you kind of let it sink and you just swim it through the water. And it's not going to be a top water bite, but they've crushed this little guy a lot. Yeah, that's that's one of my favorites. I just love how small it is and how far you can cast it. Oh, yeah. For days. All right. Uh, let's see where we're going. Next question. A lot of pressure on the fish. Get them out of the rigs. Uh, Benny said thank you. Uh, Jose is saying, unfortunately, it sounds a bit choppy. Sorry, Jose. It's We don't have good internet everywhere. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, 5G right. does not exist in Venice. Not how yet. It will. It will. Uh, so JP all is right. asking, how far out of Southwest Pass is the rip right now? Right now, let's see. It is going to be about 20 miles at most. Um, our loop current is pushed in really far, just north of Medusa. And that area is, let's see, north of, if you know what where we're talking about, you got north of Medusa, north of Hudat. Coming up north of Elf, that rip is pretty much north of all three of those rigs. And so Southwest Pass, you got 20 miles. Or if you head into Medusa, I mean, um, head into Hudat, you're looking at 25 miles. So head due south and you should hit it. And if you also can log in on Hilton's and find it on there as well. Most, you know, more current up to date. And, and so for those that who don't know, what is the rip? Okay. Oh. <laughs> the rip can be multiple things. So we have the Mississippi River, which typically dumps out muddy water. And then that water hits green water. And then our cobalt blue then hits the green water. Or you do away with the green water and the Mississippi River hits the cobalt blue water. So it's pretty much for us where two currents are hitting good and it you have a bunch of sargasm along it and you control for miles and it just brings a whole bunch of life like the mahi can be all over it you have a lot of bait fish holding on it a lot of your billfish are on it your tuna your wahoo can all be on it but the thing is the rip's not always formed up um it could be going tomorrow currents can change loop current can push out and it'll be a gradual color change from the river to blue water well, right now you're getting it defined. Here's green, here's blue. And it's it's a mudline, basically. It's a mudline. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, JP, hopefully that helps you out a bit. Uh, Will's back again saying, when you're chasing reds, do you use live bait, hard, <laughs> or soft baits? So oh, you're going to love this answer, Will. Actually, we don't use any live baits um, because when we're fishing them, live bait is plentiful. And... Uh, the only, like, you know, match or hatch kind of goes in place, but it's not typically with live bait. It's with the plastic that you're using. Um, I throw anything first, the go-to popping cork. Um, yes, the color underneath the jig head does matter. You know, it could be white with fire tail, short truce with fire tail or anything short truce. Then your next thing, if you're fishing a subsurface, could be a chatter bait. And then you got all your top water lures that could be pop orca, whopper ploppers that we throw. Um, but live bait, honestly, I do not fish any redfish here with live bait. It's all with plastics. So Will, it, it, if you haven't experienced redfish, everything you do smallmouth fishing, a redfish will eat. Is red fishing? <laughs> yeah. A redfish will eat everything. Will you can throw your neds at them. You can throw a swim bait at them. You can throw just about anything at them and they'll eat it. Yep. As long as it makes noise, it has to make noise. All right. So John is saying, no worries on the Spanish. He does have another question. Is one day enough or is it best to plan multi-day trips? Multi-day trips. Um, you know, you're just making the trip down here in a 
hit your species or you know your goal in one day it's just it's not given enough there's many variables that are going to play a part in your day and i would say two at minimum at most three to really you know maximize your fishing down here and target what you you want to get on because like i said variables change every day and you know one day could be way different than the next and a lot of our clients are three to four day clients and if first day of fishing is great, then we got multiple things to do, you know, on day two and day three. All right, John, hopefully that helps you out. Now, again, folks, uh, we're at the 40 minute mark. Uh, we are doing another Shimano school live on both Facebook and YouTube. Uh, William just said, thanks. I'm coming down. <laughs> so expect a call <laughs> from my buddy, William Clute there, Mo. Take good care Come of him. Come on, William. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we're doing another uh, Shimano school live here on Facebook and YouTube. If you guys can do me a favor, click the share button. That helps us get the word out. If you have a buddy who might be interested in heading down and seeing the good folks, Eric and Mo at uh, Journey South Outfitters, uh, tag them in the comments. It's the easiest way to go. So we're going to keep, keep taking your questions here. So write them down in the comment section. We are talking offshore rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, doesn't matter the species. Except Spanish mackerel, Mo will answer. Um, <laughs> she's got Sorry. everything else covered. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you have a question, post it down. Mo, I got a question for you regarding, Go. Uh, so, you know, so John asked about multiple days. Mm -hmm. How Weather is always a factor. I've been to plenty of places. How safe, explain to the people how safe your backup plans are in your area of Venice. Okay, so pretty much when you're coming down my husband he talks to all the clients he's going to start talking to you a week out and if if we have bad weather coming he's going to start kind of getting a feel on what you would like to do and if you choose to come down and we got high winds and i got a 27 foot bay boat that we can go in the marsh and chase redfish with so you do have options um if when People do multiple days and they mix inshore and offshore with it. We're picking our best days to take them offshore and, of course, our windier days to take them inshore. And then if they want straight offshore, we got gorgeous weather. You're going to have three days of three different styles of fishing. Everything from tuna fishing, you know, you don't need offshore stuff, to your rig fishing for cobias, mangroves, and even like open water snapper fishing. And we do go uh, wade fishing. So we, like, in three days you can you know, do everything with us. And we just have the, the equipment to do it all. And it, it's chaos once you leave, but we got it under control. <laughs> all right. That's a good one. So here's another question. Nick's asking, how's the Wahoo fishing on the rigs and what's the setup? Is that a seasonal thing, Mo, or are they there all so, the time? No, our Wahoo um, migrate here mostly into winter. So I would say... January, February, March, kind of April. And my setup's going to be a Talico 25 um, spooled with 80 pound Max Quattro with a six foot six extra double X heavy um, Therese rod. I'm fishing straight braid to a dive bait. We fish dive baits that are going to be 40 feet, 30 feet, 20 feet down. We're fish typically three of them. Um, and when we fish these, they do hang around the rigs. So we'll troll typically, you know, first we'll work the whole rig until you start marking what corner they're hanging on. And you can tell by your sounder because you're going to have one stack, two stack, three stack, four stacks. And you'll watch them at 150 and work their way up as you just troll back and forth. And our Wahoo fishing, you know, can be pretty good. We have, you know, some of the biggest fish, I think, have been caught here you know you do have occasional 90 pounders but our average are going to be 50 pounds um and it's not we're not high speed trolling we're trolling about seven knots so once the fish does hit you know we're pulling off the rig and you're actually fighting the fish uh and you know it's it's something good to do in the winter minus the fog that's the well, only thing the i don't like about but, but yeah. well worth the chase because it's such good eating i mean yes. there isn't much and, better than a wahoo no, and there's spots that we fish where our tuna pushing close on this um, lump that Wahoo hang around as well. So while you're drifting this lump for tuna, when you go to reset up, you always drag your Wahoo baits and you're going to catch, you know, usually you're catching a nice Wahoo while you reset up, mixing in with your yellowfin tuna fishing. Nice. And did you, sorry, so, Mo, did you mention the speed you're pulling at? Seven. Seven knots? I believe I said it. 
Uh, yeah. yeah well, okay. I go miles per hour. So okay. That could be so like miles per hour. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Blaine's back with another question. I think Blaine is picking your brain because he's coming down there next week. Um, <laughs> so um, you mentioned blue marlin. <laughs> Sword fishing. What about swords? All right. Sword fishing. I got a Talica 50 set up with 100 pound Max Quattro on a custom rod because I'm waiting for my nice new swordfish rod from Shimano. Anyhow, we're dropping between 1,200 to 1,600 foot. We typically do not have a bad current here. Um, you're maybe moving at one miles per hour, one and a half. We're dropping a five pound lead down. Um, all my stuff is hand cranked. So if you're sword fishing with me, you're on the rod and you're reeling that beast up. No beast masters, Mo? Uh, when I go deep dropping. <laughs> that's about it. That's the only and time. People, yeah, that's the only time. No, I'm hand cranking all my sword fish or my clients are. So. All right. Well, I, and I hope, Blaine, that was just a hint to bring one of the new Therese BWs with you when you go yeah. to see Mo and Eric. I know, good thing. You walk in luggage, you know, just get an a eight-foot luggage, wheel it on down the um, tar the mat, whatever, to the airport. Yeah, there you go. All right. And uh, this, I've seen pictures of this. Andrew, hey, Andrew, how you doing, bud? Uh, oh, he's talking about saying you have some big triple tail. What's the go-to technique? I saw some pictures like Trey Epic when he had that monster uh, he caught with you guys. Yeah, and it's funny because Trey was going to catch the world record, but his videographer did, did not press play or vice versa. Anyhow, oh God. we get some big – yeah, it's pretty funny. We get some big triple tail here, and they hang around our shallow water rigs, and I like to fish them with like a six-ounce jig head um, – on plastics and to, from what people tell me it's a lot like bass fishing i'm working the rig 360 as you're pitching to the rig letting that bait drop and popping it up and there's times they'll follow that bait all the way down and you know once you come do your first pipe i mean you pop your tight and we're going to back off of that rig because those fish are going to want to go back into that structure um and break you off so that is the challenge again you know with our big triple tail comes you know, the rig that's going to get in your way. And for us, I have two setups that I like to use to target these triple tails. They're both going to be twin powers of 5,000 and a 6,000 um, on the Travala PX rods. Let's say we're going to go seven foot medium heavy with a 50 pound Max Quattro, which we find has enough backbone. It's light enough for our clients to pitch all day because you know, you're going to be doing this for eight hours and gear can get heavy. And it's a nice light setup with good backbone to help land those big fish. And you will lose some, unfortunately. <laughs> well, you can't, yeah, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs, right? You want one of those big triple tail. Yeah. You better be ready to lose a few. You better step up and hope that your captain is watching and backs out the rig real quick. It's funny because you say you're backing out of the rig. It, it reminds me of when guys used to go like Goliath fishing on big ri on wrecks. Yeah. And they hook it and the captain slams it in reverse and pulls the fish out with the boat. So same kind of deal. And, just not a yeah. Goliath. Just not a Goliath. Because like it helps the client keep the rod loaded up and keeps that fish's head turned. Um, and just, you know, if you're a good angler, then you don't have to back out as hard. But just since I'm a guide and have people that don't understand it, I use the boat to help them land that fish. And once Great. big fish, they're going to come up and jump. And once I see that, then it's them one-on-one. -on -one. All right. Well, Andrew, you better send me some pictures of some big triple tail. <laughs> All right. And then, so uh, Shimano is saying word on the street is Benny wants a swordfish on a jig. Are you up for the challenge, Mo? Well, it's, the challenge is not for me. It's for Benny. I can go drive him out there. That's easy. So, yes, Benny, bring it. Let's do a swordfish on a jig. I'll sit there all day, watch you work your arms. Remember, I just push throttles and you jig. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we lost Mo there. We'll see if Mo comes back in. Um, all right, folks, again, I'll, I'll just keep talking here as Mo tries to jump back in. Mo, if you can see this, I'm going to send her a text while we're doing this. Folks, we're doing another Shimano Live, uh, Shimano School, and um, we just lost Mo, so we're going to see if we can get her back in. Here she comes. I'm back. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. We're all over it, it Mo. We're all over it. It just, it just shut down. It was getting tired. It's getting. It knows it's getting close to my bedtime. And it's <laughs> trying to kick me out. What are you fishing for tomorrow, Mo? 
Oh, actually, tomorrow I'm down. My husband is taking the clients red fishing. So I get to work on the big boat and clean a bay boat. And, and you hang with the pups, right? Oh, yeah. And then we work out, we shoot our bow, and then we prep dinner to do it all over again. <laughs> I got go. gear to get ready for the boys next week. Yeah, you do. Uh, the, hopefully the boys are coming with arms full for you. To get you to <laughs> test out some of that gorgeous new stuff that they... Uh, that they they've come out with that I cast you didn't get down to I cast did you Mo? No, sir. I was fishing, but I saw and I heard and I read and I, you know, admired and drooled and can't wait to get my hands on some. Yeah. It's even worse for me sometimes Mo, because I shoot all the stuff in studio and then I got to ship it back where yeah. I kind of just wish yeah. they would forget about it, but they never do. They never forget about the product. <laughs> it's always got to go back. So, so Benny Guys, saying, drive, start drive that bus. Benny said, drive that bus. Come Mo. on. All right, Benny. Pick your moon phase and get down here. I'll take you. All right. So we got another question here. Uh, we're at the 51 minute mark, folks. So we're going to take a few more questions here. Uh, and again, Shimano School, this is all about teaching you guys about new fisheries. We are with Captain Mo Newman from Journey South Outfitters. If you have not checked them out, go online. Mo, where, they, where can they find you? Where, where can people Let's hook see. up with you? Instagram, Facebook, Journey South Outfitters, website, journeysouthoutfitters.com, and the next difficult one, email, journeysouthoutfitters at gmail.com. We you kept go. it simple. That, that is perfectly simple. So <laughs> next question is White Marlin. Is there any regular fishery? And if there is, what's your setup? Um, Honestly, White Marlin are kind of in the mix when you're live baiting for tuna. Um, and my setup's just my regular tuna setup. Uh, I don't really generally specifically target them just because you could catch a sailfish out there while you're, you know, uh, live baiting for tuna because they're all eating the same small bait. So I got a Talica 25 um, on a Talus six foot extra heavy rod, um, anywhere from I'm using 50, 60 pound leader and just a little circle hook. Um, but it's, it's not something that I target, uh, but they are here. So they, there is just one of those bonuses when you're out there targeting other species. Yeah. Like your tuna fish and a lot of captains come across whites and sails all the time. And then even the blue marlin are coming in the mix, chasing your tuna and eating your live bait. So that's, you know, <laughs> there's a lot going on when stuff aligns right. So, and yeah, is this, is this primarily the floating rigs, Mo? Is this on the floating rigs? So, yeah, all of this is going to be in our deep water stuff. All our floaters, which are going to be at 1,000 to 5,000 feet. Everything wow. from, let's see, 30 miles out the pass to 80, 90 miles out the pass. Got some running. Uh, going 200 miles a day is like nothing. Oh. Huh. There's a lot of thinking that goes on in your head. <laughs> <laughs> I think about deer hunting the whole time, but we get to fishing. <laughs> oh, and it is almost fall, Mo, so deer hunting is coming. Oh, I got two months and 15 days. There you go. She knows it. It's coming. Yep. <laughs> uh, Blaine told, says you, they're bringing a ton, Mo. Yes. All right. Sweet. Uh, Jay over from what our YouTube that? channel. Jay, how you doing? Uh, so he's asking, what's the best August offshore bite? Jay Hitton, is this Jay Bird? Ask him. Did he know that I just say, is that Jay Bird? Is that Jay? Yeah, yeah. He, he'd hear that. Jay, if you are Jay Bird, just let us know you're Jay Bird. <laughs> well, anyhow, the uh, August offshore bite's good. Your tuna are typically around. Your amberjack season, no, yeah, it's typically open. You come into the end of red snapper season. You have mangroves. You got, oh, it is. <laughs> you got mangroves, you got cobia, and you got triple tail. So there is a variety of offshore fish to target um, in August. All right. So there is no single best. There's just a lot of good opportunity. Yes. Yeah, it's you can't really say best. It's just uh, right now, like, because, for instance, our bait source right now is good. So you can go and target a variety of fish right now because we're having we got the bait in. 
it seems as though your fishery is becoming a lot like what what I've learned in the Keys in Florida is that the, the person with the most bait often wins when you're out there. Mm, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> but sometimes that person with the little trick wins too. <laughs> and then mean bait. But if you, if you have the bait and the trick, then you're really set. Then you're definitely winning. Yeah. There so. you go, Jay. Hopefully, hopefully Jay Bird, that one helps you out. Um, oh, he's already coming next August. I'm going to take care of him. Yeah, there you go. He said uh, he said pet your pups for 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 him. I will. <laughs> All right, folks. So we are at the fifty-five minute mark already, Mo. You have talked about. Let me go through my head here. You've talked about cobia, snapper, grouper, wahoo, yellowfin tuna. You touched on triple tail, redfish. You touched on uh, some sword billfish. Some billfish stuff. I mean. You've gone through a lot and a lot of setups. So curious, your setups, are they based on trial and error? Or do you have a recipe now that you know based on, you know, the style of presentation versus the size of fish, what you guys are putting together? I would say it all goes on trial and error and what works best for our clients. Because remember, I'm not fishing the gear. Um, but to get to that point, I did fish the gear to see what's going to work best and what has enough backbone for my clients to land fish. Um, what line, what braid line works better on different reels with different rods. Um, like, for instance, the other day I had a client catch an amberjack and I gave him um, a Stella 10,000 with a light rod, um, a medium heavy rod. And he's jigging. And working and working, he catches an amberjack, lands it, and then he goes and grabs my ocean jigger with the extra, extra heavy. And because he thought, and he goes and jigs it, he goes, oh, this is too much, and went back to the lighter setup. So it's just trial and error like that. I know you're going to work hard, so let me give you a setup that will work with you, but yet have the backbone for you to land the fish and not some, you know, some broomstick. Yeah. So it is well, trial I mean, and error. We're in such and a good spot. It's come so far. The, the gear has gotten so much lighter so much more user friendly over the years it seems like every year when we see new stuff come out it's about getting lighter and stronger yeah it seems and it to be the focus people it yeah always definitely because for us like a lot of my clients fish and they're using it using it using it and i don't want it to wear it out and each year i feel they can last longer not so much because they worked out to come fishing with me but just because the gear is allowing them to right all right, here's another one. Uh, Red Pass Rentals. What depth rigs are you getting bait at right around now? Um, yeah, 40, 40 foot of water, pretty much. Out of Red Pass, and then, okay, I'll help you out. Red Pass, you got the Huey P, that area, you're catching bait there. And you go out of Octave, you got the 40 block, you're catching bait there. There you go, Red Pass. Hopefully, the Beaky is number out. 10. There you go, number 10. <laughs> All right. And then one more. We're going to do one more here, Mo, and then we're going to let you get back to your clients because I know you are entertaining and we are holding you up and we do appreciate you your time tonight. Um, um, Nick's I've, asking, do you ever see bluefin? Yes. Our bluefin come here in late spring, early summer, and it's all the big ones. And people do catch them. Unfortunately, I have not caught one yet. Um, but all our fish are 500 pounds and bigger. Um, <laughs> they're, you got it. Like if you see them, you got to, have a talic of 50 set up right for them because they're in deep water. So they're just going to take you to the house if you're not set up right for them. Where like up on the Northeast, if I'm correct, it's more shallow. Like we're in five, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 foot of water that those guys just go down and you got to put the drag to them to stop them. So yeah, yeah on, on the Northeast, here, they're in 80 feet of water, 120 feet of water. So they got no place to go but out rather than down. Yeah. No, ours are going down and they're saying, see ya. But people do land them, and they're giants. All right. There you have it, folks. A lot of thanks from the people here. And, Mo, just want to say thank you. I know you are doing what you and Eric do best and entertaining guests right now. So thank you very much for your time. Super appreciate it. It was fun. I learned a lot. And I, I honestly hope to get down there. One day I'm going to piggyback and slide into Blaine's luggage and come down to see you down there because I think it will be a lot of fun. Come on. Doors open. I appreciate that. All right, folks. Again, thank you, everybody, for joining us for another Shimano School. We are doing this every two weeks. Uh, I believe we are sliding back over to the freshwater world. We kind of go back and forth. Fresh salt, fresh salt, fresh salt. 
We've been doing this for quite a while now. If you have not seen these in the past, go into the video section on our Facebook page for Shimano North America Fishing, or if you go into the YouTube channel and you can see the videos. There's tons of great information and there might be something that you're very interested in that you can learn. We have some of the best field staff in the world, the most knowledgeable people, and we appreciate their time. So Mo, I'm going to say once again, thank you very much. Super appreciate your time. And I hope you have a great day. And guys, if y'all got any questions coming to Fish Venice, I will let you in on everything I know. So please contact me and I'll, you know, hope to make your trip successful when you do come down. All right, everybody. Hope you have a great night. We will see you in a couple of weeks. See ya.